Today I want to speak about being a remnant. So, what is a remnant? So let me pray before we start. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that as we sit under your word and led by your Holy Spirit, Father God, let this word become alive to us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will give us understanding this morning. Lord, that it won't just be time past, but it will be time listening to what you have to say. Lord, I pray that my words may be few, but that your power will continue to be great. And we bless you and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So a remnant is something left over. It's like if you go buy fabric and you have a long, big roll of fabric and you keep cutting, keep cutting, then that little piece that's left over is a remnant. A remnant can also be people that are left over. You'll have a big group of people all following, all doing something, and slowly but surely they start to disappear. And then when whoever's left is a remnant. So I want to read to you from Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse 1 to 4. Did you find it? Do you it? Yeah. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is known as the great apostasy. In other words, apostasy means falling away. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever belonged to a gym. Believe it or not, at one stage, I used to go to the gym. But I was really bad at it. I used to have a special card and I'd walk in the entrance, swipe my card, and then go straight out so that I didn't lose my points. So there was actually no point in paying for the gym without doing the exercise. And the Bible says to us in that scripture, that Jesus is coming back, but He won't come back until there is a great falling away. And if we look at the churches today, there is a great falling away in the church today. The word apostasy is defined as turning or falling away from the true gospel teaching as individuals or as a people. And there are many churches that are teaching a watered down, diluted gospel that no longer challenges us, no longer says that we need to repent from our sins, no longer says that Jesus Christ is the center of everything, no longer talks about the Holy Spirit as being one of the, the trinity of the, of the Most High God. And what's happened is, is we are entertained with music and lights and smoke and, and beautiful cappuccinos and everything but the true gospel. You see, we've become a bless me club. So the more people we have, the better it's going to be in terms of our revenue. And the more money we have, the more facilities we can get, and the more facilities we've got, the easier it's going to be to keep people in church entertained. You see, Jesus didn't come to entertain us. He came to save us. You see, if you want to go for entertainment, you can go down to the cinema over there and buy a ticket. When Jesus came, He paid for it, but it cost Him His life. And one can find that there are many things being taught in churches and acted out today that have absolutely nothing to do with God or with the Gospel. Sounds like a good idea, sounds like a wonderful idea. The Bible says that some faithful Christians will endure until the end and warns us of an epidemic of false doctrines. And there are lots of funny things going on in churches today. People say, no, but the Bible says this in the Bible, and what they're doing is they're taking Scripture in part and twisting it. 
because it's become a money-making operation. And success of a church, in many cases, is measured by what they have. They have this massive building. Oh man, you've got to see my congregation. I've got 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people. You look at our congregation, it's transient. The lady asked Cliff this morning, so how many people come here? And he says, well, it's difficult to say. It's really, we don't know. Some days it's full. Other days it's just a remnant. But you see, it's not about the number of people. It's about the heart. We heard him talk this morning in this. When you give, let it not be out of obligation. Whatever we do, let us not come to church because it's the done thing. We come to church because we want to worship the King. Why are we coming to church? Well, you know, I'm just scared. The Bible says you've got to keep the Sabbath holy, and if I don't, then I'm going to go to hell. And so I better go to church, and then I'll be okay. And we just go like robots. Come to church, go do the next thing. And we've lost the heart. I want to read us a little story that while I was doing my research about a doctor, a pharmacist, who diluted chemotherapy drugs for thousands of patients. He was sentenced to a maximum of 30 years. Can you believe it? That when people are desperate and they're sick and they go for medication, that the guy takes it and he adds water to it so he can make more profit. I mean, that's disgusting. Wouldn't you agree? If you go and you buy fresh juice, and they say 100% orange juice or 100% mango juice. Like, I love mango juice, my favorite. And suddenly when you get it, it's watered down. Would you be happy to pay for it? No? If, if somebody puts water in your juice? No, and imagine we wouldn't have it. Do you see how disgusted we can be about the things? And yet, so many times we're happy to accept the diluted gospel. Many services you will see people just watching what's going on. Nobody's actually got this. The Bible has to make sure that the preacher is preaching from the Bible. And not just some story. I don't know how I would feel if I was dependent on something to heal me. And I paid the full price. But I didn't get the full value. So who are this remnant? And does the Bible speak about a remnant? And what examples of being a remnant? I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm the only one left. There's nobody else. Especially on the Sunday, like we've had this time of fellowship together. And it's like, praise the Lord. And I watch you guys singing and clapping. And, and then the service ended. I become the remnant. The resident remnant in the world. And I think in many occasions we as Christians, especially in countries where the percentage of Christians are low, we feel like we're the last. Like everybody else is against us. What about me? What about me? What about me? But the remnant often comes after there's been big disaster. And I'm going to give us some examples. There was Noah and his family. In Genesis 6.18, God says this to Noah. Can you imagine? This man sees things going on. There, I'm assuming there'd be like clubs and drinking and debauchery and sin all around him. And there's Noah. And God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wives, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Out of the entire population, God picks eight people. Can you imagine? I go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, this side here. You all going on the ark, uh, guys, sorry. 
cannot. Maybe next time. If you survive the flood, you can go with this one, so we're only going with this one. You see? But you encouraged people to sit on that side. <laughs> yes, but you decided to go on that side. You see? If you, yeah. yeah. You must have had a little bit of insight over there. So come on, take it in. I want to ask. But God establishes a covenant with Noah and the remnant of eight people get saved. Another remnant was Lot and his family in Genesis 19 verse 60. And it says, And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and they set him outside the city. Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be de destroyed by God. And yet God had mercy on Lot, a remnant out of an entire city, two major cities. And he only takes those few people, four people, and says, come, says to them, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't turn back. Isn't it funny about our curiosity? If I say to you now, guys, there's somebody on the pavement, but whatever you do, don't look there now. You'll be like, I know what I'll do, I'll take a selfie. Uh, I can see what that. Our curiosity, we always want to know. God gives them a distinct warning and says, don't look back. And I think maybe for, for Lot's wife, she must have thought, jeez, I can't believe it. We've just put in new carpets and new furniture, the drapes are up and the place is looking beautiful and now we have to leave. Can you believe it? Oh! You see, it didn't look back. And she looked back. And then, then there's this guy. How many of you have heard of Mephit Mephit Bershit? Say it fast. You can't. I can't. <laughs> this young man was the grandson of King Saul and the son of Jonathan. And King Saul hated David and he did everything to harm him and kill him. And so rightly when David became king, what he should have actually done is wiped out everybody. And, and yet he has grace and mercy and he says, is there anyone that I can show mercy to? And they say, yeah, this, this, this guy, Mephibosheth, lame in both feet, crippled. Oh no, leave him, he can just die, he can become that beggar. We leave him on the side of the road. Besides, I didn't like his father. I liked his father, not his grandfather. Jonathan was my friend, but so... And he has mercy on him, and he calls him. And, and, and he's so scared when he sees the king, he falls at his feet and he begs. He says, no, 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 it's okay. In fact, whatever was due to you and your inheritance, I'll give you. And you will sit at my table, and you will eat with me. He was a remnant left over. Don't we feel a little bit like that sometimes? Undeserving, rejected, spiritually lame, emotionally lame, physically lame. Don't, you know, we don't quite feel part, we don't quite feel worthy. And yet God has mercy on us and says, come and sup with me, come and dine with me. There was another remnant, and in this case, the prophet Elijah has this major ordeal with the prophets of Baal, very excited about calling on the fire of God, the man of power for the hour, and things go completely upside down and he runs away and he goes through the desert and he ends up in this cave looking for God. And what does he do? He's brave. No, he's like, oh Lord. What about me? And he goes, listen to this. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. 
Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I, I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. How many of us feel like Elijah? You know, Lord, I've been so zealous, I've been so loving you and obeying your commandments. And look at those drunk people and look at those prostitutes and look at them and look at them and, and look at them doing false religions and look and look. It's just me. Me, I'm the good guy. I do all the good things and they're bad. And it is. And you laughing at me. And what happens? He's so busy telling God about all the great things that he's done for me. And God says, actually, Elijah, there are another 7,000 just like you. You see, we can become so introspective about what good works we do and how well we cope that we forget actually there are other people just like us also in the kingdom. Also loving God. Also obeying God. Also serving His people. In verse 18 it says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, whose knees have not bowed to God, and every mouth has not kissed Him. This apostasy that took place was when the people fell away and started to worship a false god called Baal. And I know you're thinking, yeah, but Russell, all you're talking about is the Old Testament. So I'll tell you a little bit in the New Testament. There was another remnant. You know, Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot be a part of me. And it says, this is a hard thing that you're telling us. And it said that many walked away. Many fell away. Many stopped following. And Jesus asked them, Are you going to leave me as well? And Peter says, Where shall we go? You have the words of life. Where shall we go? You see, many people are backsliding in the church today. Many people are leaving the church today using excuses. Yes, but the pastor, the pastor heard me. Or so and so was rude to me. And this happened. And we look for every reason not to serve God in the fellowship of believers. You know, you come in and somebody's sitting in your chair. Did you pay for it? What chair? But you know, I sit there every week, so move. Well, I'm not going to that church anymore. Oh, the music was awful. Mm. Mm. I don't like the preacher either. He's weird. <laughs> we run around the stage, talk funny language. And let me tell you, I would go to that church, but the other day, when I was in the supermarket, he walked right past me, like I was invisible. I even stretched my leg and I looked at him. And he ignored me. I'm never going back. You know why we're laughing? You know why we're laughing? We get offended about everything. Every time. Or if the Word of God challenges our heart, can you believe that the pastor picked on me on Sunday? He looked at me. As he was saying that scripture, he looked me straight in the eye, like his finger pointing, accusing me. <laughs> yeah. In the book of Acts 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 26. Now you must remember, Judas betrayed Jesus, and when he realized it, he went and he angry. And now the twelve were no longer twelve, they were eleven of them. Not big maths, very simple. 12, 1 dead, 11. Perfect. 
But now they want to make sure that they can complete that number again. And they think there's only one way to do it. Let's vote. What we'll do is we'll put all the candidates down with their photograph and a little block. And then we'll get everybody, we'll do a survey and we do a referendum. <laughs> and then we can get the people's choice. How we like this guy. He's handsome, dresses nicely, doesn't talk funny, he doesn't eat funny food. Yeah, okay. Tick, 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 tick. No, they didn't do that. They went to God and they cast lots. Verse 26 says, And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. You see, they moved from being disciples. In other words, being taught by somebody to being apostles, representing the one who teaches. When are we going to be moving from that stage of being disciples to teaching and showing them the one who died for them and died for us? So here's the big question. How do we get numbered? How do we become part of the remnant? We had quite a robust conversation last Tuesday night. It was fun. Woo! It was like scratching. <laughs> and eventually, each one was saying what they think. You know, <coughs> Russell, let me tell you about my experience. And we would go. And, you were, and we were going and going and going and going. And Funny at the end of it, I just said this. What does the Bible say? You see, you want to be part of the remnant. It's not about our opinions. It's not about our subjective view. It's what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? And Cliffy mentioned that a couple of times about whatever we do is, is it based on what Jesus would do? How would he respond and how would he react to it? And how do we become part of this remnant? John 3, verse 3 says, And Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can you imagine? You cannot see. It goes on to say, that, um, Assuredly I say to you, Unless you are born again of uh, uh, of the spirit and of water, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. In verse 5, we need to see and we need to get. I think, many, like many other people, that if you're born into a Christian family, we automatically we believe that we are Christians. Now that in theory would be weird because if I take a, a garage where you park a car and if I stood there and I thought long enough, would I become a car? No. You don't become born again by default. You become born again through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of Christ and Savior. Romans 10, 19, 11 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For Scripture says, whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. That's how we become part of the ring. This is not some club that you sign up and you get your membership and then when you're tired of it you, you don't pay up your subscriptions and you just walk away. This is about committing your lives to following and loving God with everything that you have. With all your being. With all your strength. All your heart. All your mind. All your soul. And do we serve God in that way? Many times I have to look in the mirror and I have to ask myself, Russell, 
Do you truly love and serve God? Do you truly love and serve others? Do you truly love yourself? And sadly, I find myself wanting. Sadly, I realize, actually, I fall horribly short. But you see, once you are born again, you cannot disqualify yourself from God's love. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Are we going to be like another, where God sees us as the only righteous one and saves us a little group of people and starts again? Are we going to be like Lot in the city where there's destruction and everything going on and God says, come, come, let me take you to a safe place. But hold on, Lord, I've left all this stuff behind. Are we going to feel like we are lame in our feet, that we don't deserve? Or are we going to have an understanding that it is the righteousness of God, it is the finished work of Jesus Christ that will save us? Are we going to be like those disciples that said, this is a very hard thing that you've told us. We cannot be with what you do. You see, following Jesus is not following rules. It's loving God. And I think sometimes we get disillusioned because we think, I just can't meet the grave. I just can't attain that thing. So we're constantly striving to get something. When really all we have to do is love God. Are we, are we Christians by name only? Are we Christians by association? Or are we Christians because we've confessed with our minds and believed in the Lord and in our hearts that Jesus died for us? You see, when we finish here, we're going to do the table. The Bible says, do not do the table in an unworthy manner. Check your heart. How's the week been? How's your attitude being to people? Jesus is coming back. But He wants not just a few people. He wants every time, every time, and every nation. Are we playing our part? To fulfilling the great call and the great commission. Are you the remnant? Or are you going to be part of the great coming back when Jesus comes back for his brother? And, and he looks at us and says, Well done, good and faithful sir. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And Father, we say that by your Holy Spirit that you can search our hearts. Lord, that as we've heard your word this morning, Lord, that there's a remnant. How do we become numbered with the remnant? Be part of what you are all about, Lord. Is that we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, Father, we want to bless you this morning. We want to thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation. And if there's anyone here who that wants to do it, that really, just really wants to say, you know, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Remember, your good works will not get you to heaven. Being a so-called Christian will not get you to heaven. Only Jesus is your Savior. And if that's you, I want you to pray with me out loud. In fact, you know what? Let us all pray. Pray with me. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for my sins. And that you were resurrected from the dead in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you are seated at the right hand of God. 
Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, to be my Lord, to be my Master, and to be my Savior. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will teach me, that you will guide me, and that you will empower me to preach the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Father God, that I am your beloved child. In Jesus' name. Amen.